Hello, everyone. My name is Christy Amobi. I work in the product division with Extral, and I will be the moderator for today's event. In today's session, Dr. Carl Butterworth will highlight research from his institution, Queen's University, Belfast, that is reversing the translational research paradigm in preclinical radiotherapy studies. His recent work, his team and his recent work have demonstrated the power of this approach in being able to accurately model clinical observations of radiation-induced cardiac toxicity. Queen's Belfast, excuse me, Queen's University Belfast has also been able to successfully reverse, translate an injectable liquid fiducial marker from the clinic to refine preclinical radiotherapy protocols. Thanks again for your attention. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Butterworth. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just uh, share my screen and then we can get started. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today and thank you for taking the time to join me for this afternoon's webinar. I'd also like to thank our colleagues at Extral for the opportunity to present some of our recent work here from Queen's University Belfast, where essentially we are trying to develop studies that are beginning to challenge the class classical bench to bedside research paradigm. And we're doing this by taking clinical approaches and observations back into the laboratory to generate novel mechanistic understanding of the underlying basis of radiotherapy response to try and generate novel ideas and hypotheses that could potentially feed forward to, to inform the development of novel radiotherapy treatments in the clinic. Just some disclosures. So I have a collaborative research agreement with Nanovi and also receive research funding from the NC3Rs, that is the, Nat, the UK National uh, Agency for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research. So by way of introduction, I'd simply like to highlight the importance of radiotherapy as a critical element of multimodal cancer care, in which around 60% of all patients receive radiotherapy with curative intent. My recent advances in the field have largely been driven by achievements in technology and engineering that have improved the way that patients are imaged and the way radiotherapy, radiotherapy is planned and delivered. My recent estimates from the Estro Health Economics and Radiotherapy Project have predicted that the demand for radiotherapy will continue to increase by around 16% over the coming years. I think a critical question remains is if we have in fact reached the technological zenith of um, engineering of what can be achieved through technology and engineering. And indeed now um, there's major interest in developing rationally designed uh, combinations of radiotherapy with molecular targeted agents. And it will be interesting to see as biologists now if we can swing the pendulum back towards driving biological advances in the clinic. And of course, radiotherapy has undergone a tremendous period of development over the past century or, or so ago, with achievements and in technology at every phase of treatment, from the development of X-rays through multiple areas of technology that have brought us where we are today in the era of advanced radiotherapy using precision image guidance and bi biologically effective delivery modalities, including protons, carbon ions, etc and of course the potential to exploit unique biological responses that have been observed at when delivering ultra uh, radiotherapy at ultra high dose rates. Now one could argue that at least on some extent these advances have also occurred in the laboratory with the development and implementation of small animal image guided radiotherapy platforms. Up until around a decade ago, the majority of radiobiology experiments in small animal models were performed using crude lead shielding approaches. And these approaches were vastly inferior in terms of the level of precision and accuracy afforded to investigators. Of course, there was no image guidance associated with these, no dose calculation methods. And um, whilst they did imp provide important information on the underlying mechanisms of radio radiobiological response, they are somewhat distant from the clinical scenario and have important Ill implications relating to animal welfare and the reproducibility of experiments using animals. So within this framework, I guess um, small animal image guided radiotherapy platforms offer co considerable advantages in comparison. Not only do the systems have image guidance capable of delivering um, uh, beams down to 0.5 millimeters, but the systems also integrate dose verification and treatment planning systems. 
Now, here's an example um, from our own laboratory for an orthotopic prostate model for some of the dosimetric advantages that can be achieved using these systems. So you can see on the right-hand panel, the, the right-hand upper panel, the type of dose distributions achieved using classical lead shielding approaches. So here, a, a major volume of uh, the bladder and rectum, the, the or normal tissue and the organs at risk um, for this orthotopic prostate tumor model are irradiated, whilst in comparison using small animal image guided approaches, there is a major decrease in the volume of the bladder and rectum that can be irradiated. So this takes us much closer to the clinical scenario and also has important implications relating to animal welfare. But what these systems are doing are allowing preclinical radiothera preclinical radiobiology experiments to be conducted in a manner much more analogous to the clinic. We can now irradiate very small volumes with multiple image guided beams with high levels of precision and accuracy and dose verification. And this is a major step forward towards improving the translational relevance of animal models and the welfare of animals within the three R's context. And really as investigators, we have become focused on translating basic research ideas from the lab through preclinical development. And if successful, these can be taken forward then into early phase and larger trials, ultimately leading to improved standard of care for patients receiving radiotherapy. Now, there are a few examples of how small image guided radiotherapy studies have provided the critical or contributed to the evidence base to support translation of preclinical findings through to um, clinical trials. And whilst this approach, this approach remains challenging, it is, of course, predicated on the predictive power of animal models to capture patient-specific phenotypes. What we're doing at the lab at the minute is to try and to take another approach, which is ch to challenge this paradigm by reverse translating knowledge gained in the, in the clinic back into the laboratory to directly inform new discoveries. Clinical trials and data mining studies can be a powerful source of information that can drive new hypotheses back into the laboratory. We think we can use this information to develop novel preclinical experiments, not only to gain mechanistic understanding of disease processes and response to therapy, and these can be taken forward to drive future advances in the clinic. So we should be begin to start to think about preclinical research not simply as a linear process, but as a dynamic iterative, pro iterative process. And I'll like to highlight this with two recent examples for, from our lab where we try to adopt this approach. So what is clear from both the clinical and preclinical settings is that visibility and positional stability of tissues are very much prerequisites of high quality precision image guided radiotherapy. And in the clinic, fiducial markers can be used to minimize the uncertainties associated with daily patient setup based on intrafraction motion and intrafraction motion. However, implantation of fiducial markers is invasive and requires surgery prior to treatment planning, which has a number of associated risks, uh, including pain, bleeding and risk of infection. There's some examples here on the left-hand panel of fiducial markers used in prostate cancer. So these are, are solid um, fiducial markers and, and gold seeds that are detectable on CT. What we see here um, is some of the artifacts that are often associated with CT imaging um, following the implantation of these markers. And then you might be able to see some indication of the markers here visible on um, MRI in this prostate cancer patient. Now, um, we believe there's significant opportunities for the future development of novel fiducial markers that have improved stability and reduced image in artifacts compared to classical gold markers. And we may also be able to um, think about developing less invasive procedures on which to uh, implant fiducial markers. So we've recently been working with Nanovi, a Danish medical device company specializing in the development of a highly innovative liquid fiducial marker that can be non-invasively injected into patients. This is the BioX platform. So BioX Mark is a highly viscous radiopaque marker that can be injected into soft tissues. It is um, detectable at very small volumes, down to around 10 microliters, with low levels of imaging artifacts and is visible on multiple different imaging modalities. So this is an example here on the left um, of an ampule of, of uh, the liquid marker, BioX mark. And um, we're comparing imaging artifacts here for clinically established markers, clinically established solid markers across a range of different imaging energies. And I think you can see here 
uh, the advantages in terms of reduced imaging artifacts that BioXMark has already delivered. BioXMark has recently gained uh, approval uh, with its CE mark, and this has really followed uh, a number of demonstrations of clinical efficacy in multiple different cancer types. We have examples here of uh, BioX mark in the upper upper panels, um, showing the very clear uh, detection of BioX mark on CT in a lung cancer patient with really excellent and very low levels of imaging artifacts. And then on the bottom panel, we have an example um, again for PET CT of BioX mark in a rectal cancer patient. Now, we became very interested in this as um, up until around 20, two, 2000, uh, sorry, 2017, there had been very little uh, preclinical development for the use of BioX Mark using preclinical models. So this study um, from the group in Munich was the first study to use BioX Mark in a preclinical model. In this study, they injected small volumes down to 10 microliters in an orthotopic pancreatic tumor model and showed that BioX Mark was clearly detectable on cone beam CT using onboard preclinical radiotherapy systems. The marker was also stable and well tolerated and showed improved contrast compared to systemic delivery of iodine based contrast agents. And in particular, this type of approach is very useful when thinking about applications for delivering multiple fractions on um, a small animal image guided radiotherapy devices. So we began to have some uh, discussions in this and, and how we can um, take, uh, harness the clinical advantages of BioX Mark, as we believe this was a, an innovative approach that could be adopted for preclinical studies to improve soft tissue alignment as a soft tissue imaging and alignment in preclinical radiotherapy studies. This, as this approach has important impacts on animal welfare and for the refinement of existing models, um, we were uh, very fortunate to uh, obtain support from the NC3Rs to take this work forward. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the NC3Rs, they are the UK National Centre for the Replacement, Reduction and Refinement of Animal Models. And their mission is really to advance the three R's by focusing on scientific impacts and benefits by providing a framework for humane animal research that reflects scientific practice. And it was under this aim that we thought that BioX Mark is really pushing the boundary of, of clinical practice in terms of improving image guidance. And this might be a very useful approach to try and back translate into the laboratory. So this work was led by uh, Catherine Brown, a very talented PhD student in my lab, who undertook a range of different experiments, firstly in phantoms, to compare imaging artifacts of BioX mark against solid gold, um, gold fiducial markers of equivalent volumes. What we see here is some of the quantifications of the artifacts associated with BioX mark compared to the classical gold markers. And again, um, these are significantly lower compared to uh, the clinical standards. In a simple flank based model, a uh, subcutaneous flank model, we injected um, different volumes of BioX mark and performed longitudinal CT analysis out to five months and assessed changes in geometry and size of BioX mark. And again, showed that the marker was very, very stable with um, no significant changes in position or size over this period. Now, up to this point, there had been no data that had demonst demonstrated or reported on the impact of BioX mark on biological response. So, as part of Catherine's study, she aimed to look at this in a uh, simple subcutaneous model. Ideally, for uh, uh, clinical applications, BioX mark and other fiducial markers are placed around the tumor or surrounding tissue for, for alignment and accuracy. However, our experimental aims were to assess the impacts of BioX mark um, on tumor response. And so what you see here is a reconstruction of BioX mark injected into the subcutaneous tumor volume. You see a little bit of BioX that um, has uh, been placed on the outside of the tumor. And then um, what we did was look at different fractionated regimens delivered, delivering a total dose of 16 gray as multiple as a single fraction or multiple fractions. From these data, we observed minimal differences in the tumor growth delay characteristics of um, the tumors when BioX mark was injected. However, what was interesting was a trend in the fractionated arms of the study suggesting slightly reduced um, tumor growth delay when BioX mark was present. 
We then moved on to review the dose volume histograms from the tumours that were injected with BioX Mark, and we were able to show that um, the tumours were um, slightly underdosed due to the high density of BioX Mark, which was segmented as bone in Muriplan. What we see here on the right hand side panel are the dose volume histograms for the tumour only groups. So you can see that a high volume of the tumour was irradiated with the prescribed dose. However, in the bottom panel, we see um, the volumes of both the tumour and BioX mark, and we can see that around 95% of the tumour um, was underdosed, whilst BioX mark received around 60 to 80% um, uh, was irradiated with the prescribed dose of 4 gray. And this trend of underdosing uh, indicated the need for carefully calculating doses when using BioX mark in preclinical models particularly for intratumoral injections when the injection site lies with inside the treatment field. So overall, these studies, we were able to demonstrate BioX Mark as an important tool for animal models that can be used to improve daily alignment. It can be injected in small volumes with low imaging artifacts and has minimal impact on response. Now, this work, I think, begins to highlight the potential to take clinically established approaches back into the lab for exploratory investigations. And in this case, we've demonstrated very strong impacts on the three R's in refining preclinical image guided techniques in small animal models. So I'd like to continue to develop this concept of reverse translation by showing how small animal image guided radiotherapy can play a key role in, the, in this process in relation to normal tissue toxicity. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with the underlying clinical concept of radiotherapy to maximize therapeutic index by increasing the probability of tumour response whilst minimising the risk of normal tissue complication. And of course, physicists have become exceptionally good at avoiding normal tissues through delivering conformal radiotherapy techniques using image guidance. And here are some examples in the, the top panel. First of all, comparing dose distributions uh, for a craniopharyngioma that can be achieved using 3D CRT, VMAT and proton beam therapy. And then also in the lower panel here, the types of dosimetric advantage showing uh, reduced, reduced volumes of um, lung in this MRI, uh, MRI guided IMRT case. Now, a lot of our knowledge on the avoidance of critical structures in radiotherapy is based on the assumption that organs are uniformly radiosensitive. However, lit normal, normal tissue toxicities from radiotherapy involve highly complex um, molecular processes often involving many different cell types and biological pathways such as inflammation and vascular damage. Now this idea um, has been explored previously, so this is a, a classical uh, example here from Liz Travis who had looked at vo irradiated volumes of the lung showing that the response is non-uniform with increases in um, breathing rate following base irradiation um, that is uh, compared to irradiation of the same volume located in the apex of the lung. Now, there's been a, a really excellent recent review on this, uh, this idea of subvolume radiosensitivity from the Groningen group, who highlighted a number of tissues that in which um, preclinical and clinical evidence suggests that there may be specific regions within these um, organs at risk that are preferentially radiosensitive. And this really raises uh, an intriguing concept around critical avoidance of substructures within tissues. And in particular, I think this is a, a really excellent opportunity to demonstrate the advantages of small animal image guided radiotherapy. And um, it's under, under this basis that we began to uh, do that in relation to um, developing novel models of uh, radiation induced cardiac toxicity. Moving forward then, so the heart is um, a, a highly complex organ that develops multiple radiation induced pathologies, including pericarditis, atherosclerosis, um, fibrosis, and valvular diseases. Radiation induced toxicity in the heart um, has a very complex pathology uh, involving multiple different cell types that ultimately, ultimately can result in heart failure. I'm thinking about the idea of reverse translation. Um, there are really multiple examples of um, incident dose to the heart that have been observed in the clinic. However, the most widely um, cited data set really comes from the RTOG 0617 from Jeff Bradley and colleagues, which was essentially designed as a dose escalation study in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, combining radiotherapy with cetuximab. 
Now, what's intriguing about these data sets, um, looking at the uh, survival curves on the left here, was that it was the escalated dose of 74 gray in which patients had significantly worse uh, survival outcomes. Now, there's been a number of different secondary analyses conducted on these data. However, um, uh, what's apparent is that deaths may be related to effects in the normal lungs and heart as a result of dose escalation. Now, classically, the heart is presumed as a parallel organ. However, different parts of the heart, including the cardiac conduction system and uh, coronary arteries, display types of responses associated with serial organs. And despite having whole heart dose limits, evidence suggests that dose to, to sensitive cardiac substructures may indeed lead to cardiac toxicities. And several groups have been looking at this um, uh, in uh, clinical studies, uh, and mostly from patients receiving radiotherapy for lung and breast cancers, and have identified adverse clinical outcomes associated with different regions of the heart, uh, as summarized in this diagram. So collectively, these data suggest the, exi the existence of critical radio substructures in different parts of the heart. Now, in particular, um, we were very interested in a study from our uh, collaborators and, and colleagues at the University of Manchester, led by Alan McWilliam and Marcel Van Herk, who used a data mining, mm -hmm. mining approach in um, more than 1,100 lung cancer patients uh, to demonstrate a highly significant region located in the base of the heart that was associated with worse survival outcomes in patients receiving curative intent radiotherapy. In this patient group, they also um, identified a threshold of around 8.5 gray. So what you see on the far right panel here uh, in, in green, um, that the patients who had doses in excess of 8.5 gray to this base region of the heart did significantly worse. And I think this, real stu this study really highlights a particular opportunity to demonstrate the potential for small animal image guided radiotherapy platforms to reverse these observations back into the laboratory. And it was on this basis that we set about trying to model this uh, in our lab in Belfast. Now to date, most preclinical radiotherapy studies involving the heart have used partial or whole heart irradiation configurations using um, conventional approaches. And working with the Manchester team, we were able to reverse translate their observations back into the laboratory by developing a novel preclinical model um, using SARP. So this was the type of treatment plan that we had designed here uh, using a three by nine millimeter collimator uh, on SARP to deliver a single fraction of 16 gray to regions located in the base, the apex or, or uh, base middle or apex in the heart. Uh, our treatment plans were designed in very plan uh, and delivered. And then the mice were placed on um, 50 week longitude uh, lifetime studies with longitudinal echocardiography and CT um, to assess uh, cardiac function and any changes in tissue architecture and density occurring as a result of these um, beam geometries. Now, we published this study last year. Uh, these are just um, an example of some of the data. Um, but essentially, we were able to recapitulate the clinical phenotype and demonstrate that cardiac dysfunction, um, uh, cardiac dysfunction following base irradiation in terms of um, fractional shortening, the percentage change in um, left ventricle dimensions with systolic uh, contraction, also myocardial performance index that incorporates both systolic and diastolic time intervals as a, as a global measure of cardiac function left ventricular posterior wall thickness resulting from cardiac um, hypertrophy, uh, which was in, uh, suggested was increased in both the base and the middle irradiated animals, and then also the EA ratio, which is a measure of early and late ventricular filling. So we, we were really intrigued um, by these findings and uh, we're fortunate that to gain support from the Medical Research Council here in the UK to address some of the outstanding questions um, associated with um, the heart-based model. So we're taking this forward over the next several years, but central to our plans is using the approach of spatial transcriptomics on the 10X Visium platform, which essentially allows us to cross-reference gene expression profiles um, with the histology of tissues to try and better understand the underlying mechanisms relating to those which we hypothesize may be driving 
um, radiation induced toxicity uh, following um, based radiation. And these include things like vascular damage, tissue remodeling, also damage to the conduction system, and potentially also alterations in the important endocrine functions of the heart. Um, this has previously been applied to uh, developmental biology analysis in the heart, but is yet to be applied to radiotherapy response and also uh, in um, adult hearts from animal models. These are some of our very preliminary data here uh, showing clusters of um, individual uh, areas of the heart which can then be cross-referenced with the histology of the tissue section. And we think this is going to provide important information to um, better understand the mechanism of, these, uh, of this type of response and to identify potential strategies for intervention and mitigation. Moving on then, we're also at the very beginning, the early stages of trying to develop better models to more accurately and comprehensively capture um, patient biology by integrating potential comorbidities that may impact on treatment response. An example of this, uh, of course, there are many um, uh, pre-existing conditions and chronic diseases, including inflammatory lung disease, uh, diabetes and heart disease that may impact on radiotherapy response. Uh, this is a, a, an, an early example here where we simply took mice that had been aged to 10 months prior to irradiation and were again able to recapitulate the, the, the phenotype here, but also observed a much earlier onset in terms of the fractional shortening associated with this, with this model. To conclude then, I'd like to finish by highlighting what I feel are some of the very important steps that as a research community we need to take to enable more successful and efficient reverse translation in our laboratories. Firstly, to realize the potential of reverse translation, we need to use technological advances at every stage of the process. This includes advanced in analytical methods and multi-omics based approaches that are currently driving big data discoveries. And we really need to think about this in terms of information from trials, taking a, a patient-focused approach. We need to use these data to comprehensively understand and better understand cancer, treat, treat cancer patients and the underlying basis of treatment response. We also then need to take a number of approaches to try and improve our preclinical models. Um, by developing patient-informed systems that accurately capture clinical phenotypes and response, gaining knowledge from genome-wide association studies, also based on comorbidities, and importantly, polypharmacy, as, um, of course, uh, cancer patients are often prescribed many different drugs that could, in fact, have competing um, treatment aims. Finally, uh, we also need to implement modern platforms to handle the large amounts of data um, from a various range of um, sources that are being generated during preclinical studies. We need to model this approach on clinical data management systems. And to date, we've only really seen one mention of this in the literature from the master group in um, developing a small animal big data warehouse research environment. And this is a really important approach that needs to um, be developed to support our ambitions of successful re reverse translation. So uh, in summary then, um, it's evident that technology is implicitly linked with innovations in the clinic. Some of these have entered back into the laboratory to allow us to deliver high, uh, high precision small animal image guided radiotherapy. The research process is classically thought to be linear. Um, however, this is not the case and we need to think about the process being more iterative and dynamic. And so on this basis, radiotherapy trials can only provide expected or unexpected outcomes. They do not fail, and these outcomes can, can form the basis for reverse translation. Importantly, reverse translation is not simply a validation method. It's a very powerful approach that can capture clinical phenotypes for mechanistic studies and generate novel hypotheses. And in doing so, we need to develop patient-informed uh, patient reverse translation really requires a multidisciplinary team approach, bringing together different disciplines outside of radiation oncology and indeed cancer biology um, to develop better models and involve stakeholders to deliver real world benefit for patients. I'd like to thin finish there um, by acknowledging the rest of the team here in Belfast, particularly uh, Mihaela Gita, who has led for several years now our preclinical platform. Catherine Brown, who has undertaken um, all of the uh, BioXMark work, and also Jared Walls, a clinical fellow in the lab, who is undertaking a lot of the 
uh, radiation-induced cardiac toxicity work. Our colleagues at the Wilkin Wilson Centre for Experimental Medicine and also in the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre are collaborators at the University of Manchester, Oxford and at the University of Washington. So I'll finish there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for joining me today and for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Butterworth. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Um, and just a reminder to the attendees, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and um, submit those questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. So uh, the first question, there's sort of two that, that are similar. Um, can you talk a little bit about the safety profile of the markers and what is the lifetime of the biomarkers in the body? Okay, so um, as I say, the uh, BioX mark is very well tolerated from um, our studies and also in uh, clinical studies, the marker has, has been shown to be well tolerated. It is biodegradable and um, will slowly de uh, degrade over a number of months. I think um, from Nanovi, this is in the order of four to six months. So uh, really the, the marker is safe and well tolerated in both humans and in mod animal models. Okay, thank you. You also mentioned that SARP had helped to translate some preclinical findings into the clinic. Could you give some examples of these successes? Yeah, so you know it, it's often quite difficult um, when convincing clinicians as to the uh, the benefits of using SARP and how it is translationally relevant. But I think there's a number of um, important examples across the field, uh, including from our own laboratory. So an example of this would be a study that we conducted several years ago uh, with with Jerry Hanna, uh, a study funded by CRUK in which we aim to evaluate the efficacy and normal tissue toxicity um, of combining inhibitors of the DNA damage response in non-small cell lung cancer. And that work really provided critical evidence to support the translation of that approach in, in the Concord trial, um, which very recently just recruited its first patient. So I think that's one example. Similarly, um, I think there's uh, various different immunotherapy combinations uh, a, a particular example from the Mastro group and also several examples, I believe, from, from UPenn um, that have used SARP to um, generate and support the preclinical evidence base for these studies. Also, um, another example uh, from Brian Marples, who had been doing a lot of studies looking at pulse low, low dose rate uh, radiobiology, and I believe that also progressed um, to clinical evaluation. So uh, several examples there, I think, in which SARP is really um, uh, contributing to the translational success of animal models and, and driving clinical trials. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the HEART study, the one where the mice was irradiated with a single dose, what was the prescribed dose? The prescribed dose was 16 gray, single fraction 16 gray. Okay, and um, did you use CT imaging to measure the thickness of the cardiac wall? Um, we do have those data sets. Uh, we haven't done that yet. The data that I presented for looking at the thickness of the left ventricular posterior wall was taken from echocardiography measurements that were performed at 10 week intervals during the experiment. Okay, this next one's kind of meaty, so I'm just going to read it read it off here. In terms of the uncertainties of dose delivery to mice models, how important will it be to the achieved levels as recommended by clinical practice and ICRU recommendations? So, um, if if I understand that question correctly, Christy, so we're talking about un uncertainty in mice models within the um, defined limits for ICRU, which I think is around um, plus or plus. Um, uh plus five percent minus ten percent something of that order of, of magnitude and um, so i think it's very important and this sort of leads back to um some of the points around uh, validation and having robust systems in place and i guess you know we're we're only as good as um the the targets that we can hit and also um have the the level of certainty with the dose that is delivered so i think it's very important um and uh, obviously there's potentially more margin for error uh, in animal studies, but nevertheless, it doesn't um, undermine the importance of being able to deliver dose accurately uh, and reproducibly in animal models. 
Okay, thank you. Um, is the BioX mark commercially available for preclinical studies and can it be used for multimodal imaging? Um, so I, I believe so. I would refer you um, to the Nanovi website for further details on um, the commercial availability of BioX Mark. Um, but certainly, you know, some of the the data that the data that we have generated really supports the use of BioX Mark in pre preclinical systems. And Nanovi are very much interested in um, positioning their products um, for preclinical studies. In terms of multimodal imaging. Um, we have simply looked at uh, the marker on CT, um, but from the clinical studies, uh, the marker is visible on CT, MRI, and ultrasound. So I would expect that it is, is um, equally useful for um, multimodal imaging in the preclinical laboratory. Okay. Uh, next question is around treatment planning. Uh, you had mentioned MIRI plan. Uh, so just to confirm, which treatment plan did you use to calculate the dose distribution and were you using the Monte Carlo algorithm or um, the analytical algorithm? No, so um, we were using the uh, uh, we were using Muriplan to to design those treatment plans. Uh, this was the um, the classical version of Muriplan, if you like. Uh, it wasn't using the Monte Carlo based um, uh, dose method. It was based on the superposition convolution algorithm on which Muriplan is based. Okay. Next question, can you talk more about the experimental design of the 10X studies? Are you over? Are you able to overlay the spatial transcriptomics with dose plans in the heart? Yes, so uh, th this is uh, a really interesting area. So essentially the 10X platform allows us to capture a six millimeter by six millimeter square um, which has the uh, the expression probes for the probes for the expression analysis. Unfortunately, we can just about fit a, uh, a a section of mouse heart onto these slides, capturing the atria uh, and some of the um, some of the ventricles. So um, we're working through this at the moment, but that would certainly be we will be able to cross reference the histology of the slide with the ex expression patterns. Uh, trying to essentially co-register those and, and potentially um, apply deformable registration um, across different animals to ensure we're looking at the same groups. And then also we should be able to cross-reference that um, with the dose distributions from MuriPlan. But of course, these, pro these processes are not simplistic um, and we're only at the early stage of um, trying to uh, design or, or go about the best way to identify um, the biological differences in these samples and really get the most from the spatial information that can be gained. But I think it's a very um, neat approach and is particularly informative when we're talking about delivering radiotherapy as a, as a targeted treatment, um, as we haven't yet been able to do that. We've sort of been um, trying to infer these types of gene expression changes based on um, the, uh, the, the fruit smoothie rather than the fruit salad, I guess. Okay. Um, the approach that you describe is based on the similarities of the mouse models to the human RT response. How accurately do mice models recapitulate the RT response? Yeah, well, I think this is a, a, a long outstanding question that has been de de debated for many years. And um, essentially the use of animal models in all fields of research is predicated on uh, genetic, genetic anatomical and physiological similarities to humans. Now, depending on which papers you read, um, uh, uh, estimates suggest that um, there's large-scale syntony across the mice and human genomes with around uh, only around 300 um, unique genes across the species. Now, specifically in terms of radiotherapy response, uh, our knowledge comes from whole body exposures or modeling studies. And these suggest that for commonly used inbred mouse strains, the radio sensitivity varies by around a factor of two with um, mice being more radio resistant. Now, of course, um, this could be significantly less than that um, when we're thinking about individual organs um, within the animals. Um, so yes, I think they are uh, um, robust models um, when used correctly and within, you know, with an appreciation for, for their, their limitations. Um, there's also been a, an interesting narrative around this in terms of how closely um, responses to um, uh, endotoxemia or, or burns 
actually model um, responses in humans from uh, Shaw Rorn that's been developed over over several years now and, and has been presented at, at several uh, previous um, SARP meetings. But essentially, um, in those gene expression studies, they uh, the initial analysis showed that there was very little uh, homology in terms of response across mice and humans. However, retrospective analysis of the data showed that there was very close similarity in terms of response. So I think the jury's still out, but that's the information that we have at the minute. Uh, radio sensitivity for whole body exposures by around a factor of two. Okay, great. Uh, just also a point of clarification from the, the team at Inovi, uh, BioX Mark is CE marked and commercially available. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that. And then I just had one one final question here. Um, you had provided evidence of the heart base as a radio sensitive substructure. Um, what do you see as, as being next for the team there, and and how do you think you can further improve this model? Yeah, well, I I think you know our study, our initial study was done as a single fraction study, and um, we still don't know the dose response. We've only looked at a single dose of 16 gray, so we need to uh, map the dose response and also consider the impact of fractionation. Um, I think, you know, we still don't know what the, 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 base, uh, the base of the heart is a very loosely defined structure. Uh, there's multiple different um, uh, parts of the heart within that region, and we need to better define what the critical su structures are and indeed uh, the particular uh, target subtypes. We need to take it forward and also identify the mechanism um, underpinning these effects uh, associated with cardiac dysfunction, whether it indeed is related to vascular function, uh, dysfunction of the conduction system, or potentially uh, uh, endocrine dysfunction. So there's many um, areas for further investigation there that we're hoping to take forward over the next coming years. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, that that was the final question, Dr. Butterworth. So on behalf of Extra, I just would like to thank you again for presenting your research here today and uh, also thank all the attendees for your attention. As just a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be available on our website and you also will receive a copy if you'd like to review it at a later time or share it with a colleague who wasn't able to attend today. So again, thank you so much for your attention and time and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. And with that, I'll conclude the session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chrissy. Bye.